Hare Krishna, my name is Henry Duck Torsky. I'm a former disciple of Kirtanananda Swami Bhaktipad and a former resident of the New Vrindavan, West Virginia Hare Krishna community. Some of my god brothers and sisters still call me by my Sanskrit name, Rishikesh Das. I'm also the author of 12 non fiction books about Hare Krishna history Killing for Krishna, Eleven Naked Emperors and ten volumes of Gold, Guns, and God, a biography of Kirtanananda Swami Bhaktipad, and a history of the new Vrindavan community. Today I'd like to talk a bit about the recently released documentary film titled Krishna's Guru's Karma Murder, which was released appropriately on October 24th, 2023 which was the 12th anniversary of the death of Swami Bhaktipad. It's a three-part, three-hour documentary which can be seen on the Peacock TV streaming service. The film was produced by Marwar Junction Productions in collaboration with Entertainment One, which is a multinational company involved in the acquisition and production of films and television series. Let me tell you a little of the backstory of this film. It was nearly six years ago, in uh, 2018, my first book of Hare Krishna history, Killing for Krishna, was published. A year later, the Wondery Podcast Company in Los Angeles released a seven-episode podcast series based on my book. It was titled, The Hare Krishna Murders, part of their American Scandal series. I served as consultant for the production. Soon after, the people at Marwar Junction Productions heard the Wondery podcast and thought, what a great story, this would make a great documentary film. And yes, I agree. The story of Swami Bhaktipad and New Vrindavan certainly would make a great documentary film. So, in February 2020, Marwar Junction Productions contacted me to see if I'd be interested in working with them on their proposed movie about Swami Bhaktipad and New Vrindavan. I was naturally interested. And I sent them about a hundred photos from my photo library. In the film, they use about a dozen of my photos. And I also suggested people that they might interview for the film. They wanted me to sign a contract to option my books, that is, to purchase the rights to my books for a time so they can develop the project into a film. However, I never signed a contract with Marwar Junction Productions and Entertainment One because another documentary film company contacted me soon after and offered me a better deal. And so I signed a contract with the other company. Okay, enough of the backstory. Let's talk a bit about the film Krishna's Guru's Karma Murder. There are many good things about this film. It's professionally produced, camera work is excellent, there are some terrific archival film footage. The music is excellent. I suppose not many people notice the soundtrack to a film, but I do, as I'm a professional musician. And many, many people are interviewed in the film. I counted 28 people in the cast whom I will name now. A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, from archival film footage, of course. Three ISKCON gurus appear in the film. Kirtanananda Swami Bhaktipad, also from archival film footage. Bhagavan Das, formerly a Swami, an ISKCON zonal acharya guru. And Hridayananda Das Goswami. Iskan Guru and former Zonal Acharya. Other Prabhupada disciples appear in the film, such as Shamasundar Das and his former wife Malati Dasi, both joined Iskan in San Francisco early in 1967. Shuta Kirti Das, who formerly served as Prabhupada's personal servant. Anuttama Das, currently director of Iskan Communications for the last several decades. Dharmatma Das, the notorious former Sankirtan leader at New Vrindavan. Dvija Priya Dasi, Dharmatma's favorite wife, currently together for some 45 years. Dhruva Gorak, the son of Dharmatma and Dvija Priya. 
We also hear from Christina Autry, formerly Christina Mills, Pradhanagopika, Dharmatma's least favorite wife. And Premanjana, the daughter of Dharmama and Pradhanagopika. In the film, we also see a clip of Solochan Das, who wrote an expose on the Iskan Gurus called The Guru Business. He also threatened to kill Bhaktipada and his own Acharyas. He appears in the film, of course, also from archival film footage. In the film, we see and hear, actually, we don't see him, we just hear him, Puranjana, Solochan's best friend, and who, one of the first critics of the Zonal Acharyas. We also hear from Tirtadas, formerly Swami, from what appears to be a telephone interview from prison. Other current ISKCON members who appear in the film are Jai Krishnadas, current New Vrindavan Temple President, Anu Radhadasi, current, uh, she's the New Vrindavan's Communications Department, we hear from Bhima Karma Saragrahi, a new Vrindavan Gurukula alumnus, and the son of the murdered Charles St. Dennis, or Chakradari Das. We also hear from Chaitanya Leela Palkania, and that is Bhima Karna's newly wedded wife. Non devotee people who appear in the film are Thomas Westfall former Marshall County, West Virginia Sheriff's Deputy, known as the Krishna Cop, Tashia Rose, the daughter of Richard Rose. Her father was the Marshall County mystic and landowner who wanted to start a non-sectarian spiritual ashram and who leased the original New Vrindavan property to High Greva in August 1968. We hear from David Gold, Solochan's Moundsville attorney who wrote a book uh, about uh, about his his uh, uh, spiritual master, who was Richard Rose, and uh, there's several chapters about Solochan in there and his murder. We also hear from John Turok, who was another attorney who represented Solochan. We hear from Jeff Banwell, a former FBI officer who worked on the New Vrindavan case. We hear from Paul Tippin a former detective for the Los Angeles Robbery Homicide Division, the Police Robbery Homicide Division, and his partner, Leo Orozco. And finally, Ronald Piat, who is the Kent, Ohio police officer who arrested Thomas Drescher. Well, well, there are many wonderful things about this three-part film, in all honesty. I cannot recommend this film to anyone because it's like terribly biased. It's shallow. It's one-sided. It's prejudiced. It's skewed. It's slanted, twisted, warped. The movie portrays Kirtanananda Swami as a totally corrupt and evil man and it portrays Iskan and the Iskan Gurus as totally honest and pure and saintly men, for the most part. And that viewpoint is incorrect, my friends. The film producers only included in the film interviews with people who had bad things to say about Bhaktipat. One interviewee, John Turok, who had served for a time as Solochan's attorney, expressed his personal perspective, quote, He's manipulative. He's power hungry. He was the devil incarnate. Unquote. I ask, what does Turak know about Bhaktipad besides what Solochan told him? I'm not disputing Turak's claim that Bhaktipad was manipulative and power hungry. He was. But his is a myopic or nearsighted view of a man who was for years revered as a pure ambassador of Krishna by thousands, even by ISKCON GVC members and gurus. And don't forget, even Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada many, many times praised his first sannyas disciple and once claimed that, quote, 
Kirtanananda, he is a pure devotee, unquote. So in a word, the film is unbalanced. It's not fair, nor an accurate documentary. If I had been involved in this production, you would see both sides of Kirtananda Swami's personality, the bad and the good. And you would also have seen both sides of Iskan, the good and the bad. There's another major fault in this film, and that is the premise that Bhatipat ordered the assassination of Solochan. The producers interviewed Tirta in prison by telephone, or so it appears, and Tirta explains, as he did at the August 1994 grand jury at the United States Courthouse in Whitting, West Virginia, that Bhaktipad personally ordered him to murder Solochan. But this is fantasy. The conspiracy to murder Solochan was formulated in late October 1985 when Bhaktipad was in a coma at Allegheny General Hospital in Pittsburgh after suffering severe, life-threatening head injuries inflicted by a mentally disturbed devotee who had tried to take Bhaktipad's life. And after Bhaktipad returned from the hospital to New Vrindavan, he could hardly walk or talk due to his injuries. In addition, he was afflicted with anterograde amnesia, a serious malady which affects the memory. Short-term memories fail to get transferred to the region of the brain where long-term memories are stored and accessed. In other words, Bhakti Bhakti could remember things, could not remember things that happened sometimes only a few hours earlier. When Salochan was murdered seven months after Bhakti Pad's near-death injury, Bhaktivedanta's memory was still so bad that Kaladri, the New Vrindavan Temple president, claimed a week after the murder that Bhaktipad knew nothing of the murder plot. His memory had deteriorated to such an extent that he was completely out of it. Kaladri said, quote, He doesn't even know what's going on half the time. He's out of it. Unquote. Factually, Bhaktipad did not become involved in the conspiracy to murder Solochan until after the murder, when he and Radhanath Swami drove to Dharmatma's house to get $6,000 in cash to deliver to Tirta, so he and his family could fly to India and hide out from U.S. law enforcement. Tirta, Tirta admitted this to me in an October 2004 letter Tirta in prison said that he had never personally heard Bhaktipad give him an order to murder Solochan. So, I mean, Tir we know Tirta's a liar, all right? Now, what was the lie? That Bhaktipad ordered him to murder Solochan or that, or that he claimed Bhaktipad ordered him to murder Solochan? So, we, to, to, to understand this, we must reflect on the circumstances at the time when Tirta changed his tune. For eight years he had protected Bhaktipad and took the entire rap himself. He also protected the other dozen or so members of the murder conspiracy. However, in March 1994, Bhaktipad refused a plea bargain with the U.S. government in which he could have pleaded guilty to some crimes and serve a short prison sentence of a few years. And in return, the government promised to stop their attempt to confiscate the New Vrindavan properties which were involved in the lawsuit. New Vrindavan could go scot-free, no more worries. However, Bhaktipad refused the plea bargain and the community was put into danger of forfeiture. Tirta and many others thought Bhaktipad should have admitted some guilt and accepted the plea bargain. This would have, would have absolved the community from any attempts to forfeit their property. Tirta decided at that time that Bhaktipad was irresponsible and also possibly a madman for putting the New Vrindavan community at risk like that. So Tirta decided that Bhaktipad should go to prison 
just like Tirta. So, at the August 1994 grand jury, Tirta testified that Bhaktipad had ordered the murders of Salochan and Chakradari. Although factually, Bhaktipad had not personally given him the order. It's really unfortunate that these points were not mentioned in the film. It's quite obvious that the filmmakers had their own agenda. An agenda which in effect made Bhaktipad into the villain and the rest of his gun as the heroes, more or less. One of my friends, Jyotir Damdas, who was a member of the conspiracy to murder Salochan, who has admitted his guilt and claimed that it was Radhanath, not Bhaktipad, who ordered the assassination of Salochan, told me that he was also interviewed for the film, but his testimony never appeared in the final cut. He also told me that John Mastami, one of my god brothers who hunted Salochan in California, and who claims that it was Radhanath, not Bhaktipad, who recruited him into the murder conspiracy in January 1986. He was also interviewed, Jyotir Dham claims, but John Mastami's testimony also did not appear in the film. That's uh, obviously because the producers had their own agenda to paint Bhaktipad as an evil man and consequently the others who planned, organized and funded the conspiracy to murder Solochan, such as Radhanath Swami, Kaladri, Rameshwar Swami, etc. They get away scot-free again and Iskan looks pure and sweet, innocent as a child. This film almost appears to me as if it was produced and created by Iskan, because Iskan is portrayed as a totally wonderful, holy and responsible society, and that is not the case. And Badiba comes out looking really, really evil. This film really needed someone who was expert on New Vrindavan history to edit the show. So many of the people interviewed were just spouting nonsense, presenting fiction as fact. A lot of the interviewees didn't know the real story, but they pretended that they knew the real story. Few people in the film presented as much fiction as Fred Dayananda Das Goswami. <laughs> it seems every time he spoke, he spread some fiction as fact. Now, I'm not going to talk about him in this video. But you can read my comments about him and my rebuttals in the text which uh, I'm going to put below this video or perhaps on a page on my website. In my opinion, the hero of this movie is Bhima Karma. He talks about the abuse he received as a child at the Nuvrindam Gurukula and he talks about the murder of his father, Chakradari, which happened when Bhima Karma was only six years old. His story is riveting, and his suffering may provoke tears in viewers' eyes. But the movie has a happy ending. Bhima Karma, some 30 years after the death of his father, travels to Vrindavan, India, with his long-lost brother, as Chakradari was extremely successful at getting many women in bed with him. And on the boat on the Jamuna River, Bhima Karma spreads his father's ashes in the river and thus accomplishes a type of closure. In addition, as seen at the very end of the film, Bhima Karma then marries a lovely young lady who seems to be a very compatible match for him. And the wedding scene it, it really brought great joy to my heart. A boy who suffered greatly for years at New Vrindavan with abusive teachers, who spent decades in therapy, soul-searching, processing his emotions, finally appears to conquer the demons in his heart and his past and leads what appears to be a quite normal life free from his past emotional trauma. I consider Bhima Karma to be a hero and, and I really admire and applaud him. So anyway, watch the movie if you must. You might like it, 
and perhaps learn something new about ISKCON history. But remember, the movie is biased. It portrays Bhaktipat as the villain and ISKCON as the freedom fighters, when that is not true. ISKCON leaders had a hand in the murder of Salocha. In fact, likely much, much more than, than Bhaktipat had. Remember that this movie only tells a small part of the story of Swami Bhaktapad and New Vrindavan and its prejudice. Uh, I do recommend that if you want to <clears throat> learn a more complete and balanced story about Bhaktipad and uh, the murder of Solochan, please read my book, Killing for Krishna. I, I think, I think you'll, you may appreciate that. All right. To sign off, Om Tat Sat, and thanks a lot.